We're on a mission from God. Wendy? Stay away! So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad. On the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of Oh God, Book 2 on October 3rd, 1980. It was written by Josh Greenfeld and Hal Goldman and Fred S. Fox and Seaman Jacobs and Melissa Miller, based on a story by Greenfeld and a novel by Avery Corman previously adapted into the first film, Oh God. This was directed by Gilbert Cates and released by Warner Brothers. So was there was only one book? There was one book and there's three movies. Oh, well, that's unnecessary. <laughs> In 1971, author Avery Corman's first novel, Oh God, was published. In 1977, it was adapted into the film of the same name, starring George Burns as God and John Denver as his prophet. <laughs> I don't know why John Denver is in a movie. The first installment was directed by Carl Reiner and written by Larry Gelbert. And it apparently did well enough to warrant a sequel. And so, oh God, book two was greenlit. Did you watch that one? I did. I watched the first one. Yeah. I, I remember distinctly watching all three of these repeatedly as a child. Really? Like I rented them and then I rented them again and I probably rented them a third time each. Huh. Okay. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> There's nothing for kids in these movies. Yeah. yeah. I mean, George Burns is kind of funny, but the rest of it was just, I have no idea why I rented this other than maybe the cover box looked neat. So good job, whoever did that. Um, I, I have memories of watching at least Oh God, and I was aware that there were other ones later on in my life, but I never, I've never watched them. I've only ever seen the first one. Yeah, I'd never seen any of them before. In my head, they were much funnier and more involved. Like when we were coming up on this, I was like, oh, I remember that. It's kind of like a fun adventure thing. I do not remember it being this small scale of a movie. Well, when you're a little kid, I suppose the adventure that she goes on seems kind of grand. I yeah, don't I don't know. I just, um, I maybe maybe they do more in Oh God, You Devil, which I did not rewatch in time for this. But I thought it was like, for some reason in my head, it was like, like problem child, but with god in it where mm. it was like this huge scale like laugh a minute thing hmm. and it's not that yeah. it's just like a bunch of quiet somber conversations about god yeah and i feel like george burns was on set for maybe a week <laughs> yeah george burns is the only person from the first film to come back for the second film and while this one performed quite poorly it still somehow made enough to get a third installment in oh god you devil which uh we mentioned before stars uh, George Burns, but this time he's playing God and the Devil. Director Gilbert Cates spent five months trying to find a child to play the role of Tracy Richards, and he found 10-year-old Lou Ann starring as Annie at the Schubert Theater. She's one of the youngest people to play Annie. He also directed The Last Married Couple earlier this year, so it seems hmm. crazy that you would direct a movie, spend five months casting a single part for the next movie, and direct and release that movie all in the span of a year. It's productive. Um, pretty impressive. But Luann is a, like, one-name celebrity. She's a child actress who just went by Luann. Did she, did she do other movies? Uh, I mean, I not we'll a get lot. To that. Um, but, yeah, we'll get to it. We start in God's POV from space? Uh, There's I don't clouds, know where we are. though. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um, it's unclear because <laughs> we're looking up through clouds in a blue atmosphere at Earth in the sky. Uh, are there clouds in space or... Is the God there a, are. <laughs> is called God nebula. On, yeah, is, he, is he in a nebula? Is he in the blue nebula? The famed blue nebula? Is he on another planet with a blue atmosphere that we haven't discovered yet? I mean, maybe it's one of those things like we had in Hercules in New York where you just like look into like, you know. Sure. A, <laughs> a foggy crystal ball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what's going on. God complains about how badly he screwed up with Earth. Millions of planets and that one has always been a problem. Why that one? I know why. People. I thought this was just going to be like an apocalypse movie all of a sudden. Like, <laughs> I'm going to murder the people. I would have enjoyed that. The camera pans across the skyline and drops down into the suburbs. We move into a house where Tracy Richards is getting ready for the day, feeding her fish. Uh, on her way out, she seems hesitant to wear her hat, 
and from another room her mom reminds her to put it on before she escapes the house without it. But her mom catches up with her in the driveway and puts it back on her head. Totally irrelevant point. Yeah. Mom, who wears hats? Young ladies do. And everyone wears a hat for the whole rest of the movie. (laughs) Every woman in this movie is wearing a hat. (laughs) It seems as though her parents are separated and she's having a dad day. Dinner at a Chinese (laughs) restaurant and movie after that. a dad day. Dad day. Just making it clear. Had a dad day. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> She's, they're going out for Chinese food and a movie. On her way to her dad's car, she chats for a bit with the neighbor kid, Shingo. He's jealous of the attention that she gets from her separated parents and laments that Japanese parents don't divorce. It reminded me of a bit from the home movies animated series because two of the three main kids have divorced parents, Brendan and Melissa, but Jason's parents are happily married. So in one episode, he keeps lying about them fighting because he wants desperately for his parents to divorce (laughs) so he can fit in at school. (sighs) It's really bad here, guys. There's definitely a divorce coming on. Hold on a sec again. Give me a break! He doesn't want chicken, Mom! Dad picks her up, and they head out to the restaurant. Apparently, he landed a new account at his ad agency, and he tells her she can splurge today. He sold a slogan to a spaghetti company, The Taste of Mom, which is gross. (laughs) No. Is it Mom or Mama? (laughs) I think he says Mom in the car. Oh, does he? But she says Mama later when she's talking to the psychologist. He talks her through the commercial, and she doesn't seem impressed. Maybe because it's a commercial for spaghetti that ends in a big disco number? <laughs> no. But that's how we do it. That's how we sell milk. That's how, yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> milk. We sell spaghetti. Do the milk, shake the milk, shake, do the shake. He hands her a can as a gift, and she identifies it on site as a can of snakes and calls him out. At their table in the restaurant, Dad asks Tracy what movie she'd like to see, and she says, Attack from the Hidden Planet, and he seems less interested. Apparently, she always drags him out to sci-fi nonsense. Daddy, it's supposed to be terrific. Oh, yeah, some terrific. You said that about the one last week. What a thriller that was. In one second, a plant turns into a person? Come on, Tracy. Dad asks why they can't just see a movie with Laurence Olivier, just the jazz singer for this year, 1980, uh, Walter Matthau, suggesting Little Miss Marker or Hopscotch, or Benji, suggesting Oh, Heavenly Dog. But the movie she's picked out sounds more like Battle Beyond the Stars, which I would rather see in theaters than any of these other choices. (laughs) <laughs> especially the jazz singer for which <laughs> olivier shared his razzie with the kid from gloria in defending the movie she says that all the weird sci-fi stuff was explained but they explained it daddy oh yeah it was because they came from another planet mm. i mean their spirits did i didn't see any spirits what spirits daddy you can't see spirits huh daddy just because you can't see spirits doesn't mean they're not there it's kind of like believing in god Sometimes you just have to believe in things you can't see. This whole bit is very clunky and forced. Is this like some sort of Scientology movie? That's what it, that's what it <laughs> honestly felt like. They're spirits from another planet and they get dumped in a volcano by 747s. That's what it felt like. It sounds like she's just talking about, what, what is that uh, John Travolta movie? Oh, Battlefield the Battlefield Earth. Earth. Battlefield Earth. Yeah. It, doesn't that tell the story? Or I don't know. Well, it, I never it, saw it. It's not, it's not, I don't think it's that story. But, but it's it, just it, Zenu's it origin story? I don't even think it's that. I think it's just another uh, uh, Don Herbert, or not Don Herbert. No. no, Hubbard. 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 L. Ron. L. Ron Hubbard. That's right. <laughs> Little Miss Hubbard. <laughs> Sat in his cover. Sorry. I, I, I hope that people don't get offended when I said Don Herbert, who was, I believe, Mr. Wizard. <laughs> well. It's okay. They're both wizards in a way. <laughs> I'm glad that I had forgotten L. Ron it's Hubbard's okay. name. I, <laughs> yeah. I forgot Good it for too. <laughs> Sorry for reminding you. But yeah, th- I, I really didn't like the way they're they're forcing this whole... Like, oh, this is this is how they get on the subject of talking about God. There were spirits in a movie about aliens that you couldn't see unless you believed in them or something like that. It's just like, this feels like a, a fourth or fifth draft of, how are we going to bring God up in this conversation w- between this father and daughter? If you're going to see this movie already, I'm assuming you've seen the first one. Yeah. And I'm assuming you know that God is in this movie. Why, why does it have to be a sci-fi movie that they're going to? Why can't it be a religious movie or something? Yeah, or or like she could just say like, you know, it like don't don't go through that whole long speech. Just say it's like you know you you gotta believe in spirits. It's like you believe in God. There. Yeah. That, the end. Yeah. That's it. Dad steps away from the table to call his girlfriend, and Tracy asks if he can please stop seeing her because she isn't pretty enough, despite her big boobs. Like that's that's her number one complaint is she's not as pretty as mom. And it's like, 
Is that all that matters to you, yeah. kid? Mm-hmm. It's but, pretty shallow. But also, this super bothers me because as soon as we see the girlfriend, A, she doesn't have especially big boobs, and B, she's super pretty. Yeah. So I'm like, what, what well, is the, with this it's assessment? Just, <laughs> it's, it's a child of divorce is obviously going to be like, everyone's ugly except for my mom. Like, that makes sense. Yeah, but me. I think the dad also goes along with it. Like, I think he just knows that she's. But he's like, oh, she's got other features that I like. You know, like, no, he doesn't defend her and be like, what do you mean? She's really pretty. I don't think I would try to argue with my daughter in that situation either. I I'd guess. just be like, okay, fine. She's ugly. Whatever you say. Anyway. Why, why would you call her in the middle of eating lunch? Yeah, I, that part was more confusing. Yeah. Uh, that he just gets up and walks over like, I just got to make sure she's alive. You I'll have right limited back. time with your daughter. Yeah. 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 Let's I, just focus here. I, I, I get that she needs to have time to open the fortune cookie, but- she can open the fortune cookie with him sitting there. Yeah. 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 I'd be like, I don't even know what this one means. Meet me in the lobby. Bye, Dad. <laughs> she gets up and leaves. Tracy cracks open a fortune cookie to read, Meet me in the lounge. God. A second fortune cookie reads, I mean you, Tracy. God. She walks out to the restaurant lobby and through a red door that opened magically. A disembodied voice welcomes her, and at first she thinks it's her dad playing a prank in someone else's voice, I guess. A couple women come out of the restroom, and God points out that if this was a prank, wouldn't they hear my voice? And they confirm that they don't hear him. So, are they coming out of a restroom? Yeah. I'm pretty sure, yeah. So, what kind of lounge is this? I don't know what this room is. (laughs) When when he said lounge, I thought it was just like a private dining room. No, I think, like, they mean the lounge is the area out in front of the restroom because sometimes it's restrooms, like an antechamber for yeah sometimes bathrooms. restrooms have seating areas like yeah attached but this to is them. a huge room but i think that this is that for both restrooms it yeah. is like a seating area because the only reason i think it's a bathroom is because one of the women coming out of the bathroom picks up a jacket that she left draped over one of the chairs outside god tells tracy that he was inspired by what she just said about alien spirits in a sci-fi film and that you have to believe in things like God, for example. Like there's nobody more devout on earth, like dedicated yeah. to God that has some sort of like, you know, nope, I belief just, in spirits. I heard <laughs> one girl compare me to A sci-fi plant movie. aliens. <laughs> yeah. That's definitely the one I need to touch base with. Yeah. Not 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 the entire like Roman Catholic yeah. population. <laughs> or Somebody the, spent the hours Pope. today talking about you and you came to this girl uh, who loves sci-fi. <laughs> Also, it's weird that she knows someone who's coming in to the restroom. Yeah. Well, like, I, th- I yeah, it seems like who she's... is this person? Because we see her one other time later, but from a car. Yeah. But I was like, who is this it woman? Se- it seems like the mom of a of another student that she or goes just, to school with, or something, or just another hat enthusiast of the town. <laughs> Because she's wearing this weird, like, bowler cap here. And later she'll be driving a car wearing a cowboy hat. Like a weirdo. (laughs) Take that ridiculous thing. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, God leaves suddenly and Tracy embarrasses herself in front of another stranger before leaving the room. Driving to the movie theater, her dad comments on her sudden silence. And she tells him she feels like she's daydreaming, kind of. Like, Dad, you ever feel like you're having a dream, but but you know you're awake? And he says, yeah, it's called daydreaming. It's normal. He stops at his office on the way to the theater, and when she's alone in the car, God starts talking to her again. First, he's complaining to her that people don't think about him enough, or at least until they're on their deathbeds. Tracy suggests performing miracles or something, reminding people that he exists in any way, and he says, Eh, people remember the miracle and forget why I did it. I've got it. Then she suggests her father's business, advertising. She sells him on the idea of developing a slogan, and he gives her the assignment. He says, you come up with the slogan and I'll get it spread around. She's worried as a kid that she isn't up to this task. And then God lays out his whole creepy plan (laughs) as we're slowly pushing in on George (laughs) Vern's face. He says, you see, Tracy, if it comes from you, it'll be something that your friends can understand. That way I'll have the children on my side. And when they grow up, I'll have their children. Once you've got the children, (laughs) that's the ball game. Fill them pews, people. Yeah. I don't understand this whole thing. I mean... It just, this whole concept of this movie bothers me. It reminds me a little bit of um, in the line in, in God We Trust when he was like asking God why he wants to be praised so much. Like it doesn't yeah. really make sense. Like wh- what, 
what do you care if these people are all like remi- reminded of you every day? Like, yeah. What What is the end goal of getting people to think about you and believe in you and and love you? I don't I don't really understand. Yeah. Like you're all powerful. I don't I don't get why you need this. But this God isn't all powerful. Like he makes that clear over the course of the movie that this God isn't all knowing and he isn't all powerful. So is that true? When does he make that point? Because well, we'll we'll get to it. I have okay. notes. <laughs> you have yeah. notes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it also bothers me that like. Uh, she says at one point, like, oh, if, if we got you a slogan, like, you'd be a household name. And he's like, oh, a household name. I like the idea of that. And it's like, God is already a household name. Everybody's heard of God. Yeah. We're good. <laughs> he sounds like the executives selling flavored vape juice or something. His wording is very nefarious here. Before he disappears, he tells her that if she shares her visions with anyone, that they'll think she's crazy. But she doesn't heed this advice. But what a burden to then also yeah. have picked this child to be like, oh, by the way, I, uh, I'm i going to pick you and don't tell anybody about this, but do this task uh, because you will be ostracized and potentially, you know, have harm yeah. come to you. And I thought this was all going to come into play in a much different way when they have the first meeting with the principal, which we'll get to when we get to that. Yeah. yeah. We cut right to them coming out of the movie early, apparently, like they didn't even finish the movie. Uh, It sounds like she was eager to get started on God's new slogan. And then she finds a roundabout way to ask her dad by saying, hey, dad, what's a good slogan for God? (laughs) Basically, (laughs) She's like, oh, let's say you're selling a person, a very important person. Let's say uh, God. And uh, and her dad's like, oh, well, first I'd start with a list of his qualities. And then he's like, then I write a slogan and then I'd invite him out to lunch. And it's like, okay, you skipped the part that I needed. <laughs> um, but uh, God already told her to come up with the slogan herself. So God's obviously going to shoot down anything that her dad just blurts out here anyway. They head out to pick up Joan, the girlfriend, and Tracy cannot shut up about her dad's girlfriend's boobs as they pull up to the apartment building. Tracy hops in the back seat, and then Joan gives her dad a big smooch, which she totally deserves to see, considering how shitty she's being. Hi, Stacy. Tracy. Oh, uh, of course. (laughs) Like, she doesn't care about this kid. Uh, She picks up the can of snakes, and as Tracy predicted, it erupts in her face. A bunch of snakes. When she gets home, Tracy's mom asks, Hi, how was the movie? Dumb. Oh. <laughs> that's her That's her review of the movie. She didn't even watch all of it. How does she know it's dumb? Spoiler alert, I will probably play that clip again later in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy tries multiple times to ask mom for advice in her predicament, but mom just wants to know what Joan was wearing or where they were going or how good she looked because her mom is terrible. Tracy asks her mom for a list of God's qualities, but she doesn't have time and leaves. Tracy promises not to watch horror movies with her nanny, but then we cut immediately to her watching a horror movie. Her nanny has to watch the movie through her fingers. I loved that. <laughs> I, I love this old Hispanic woman like just being terrified of the film. And she's like, "You don't have to. You don't have to watch it like that. You should look at it." I she's prefer like, it no, like this. I prefer it this way. <laughs> Tracy asks the nanny if she ever talks to God, and Rosa says that she talks to him every morning. Rosa here <laughs> has probably my favorite line of the whole movie. And did God talk to you? No, he never talks to me. Maybe he doesn't understand Spanish so good. (laughs) Like, that's the implication of, like, the entire American situation is that, oh, God just doesn't understand us when we're asking for things. Throughout this entire conversation, we're still hearing the score of this horror movie playing on the TV, which lends it a very eerie feel. I think it's on purpose, but it just comes across as very strange. Rosa? Yes? What would you say? If I told you that I saw God today and we talked to each other. Very terrifying. Rosa turns off the movie because she says it's making Tracy crazy. Later, Tracy tells Shingo the whole story and he mocks her for a bit and admits that he doesn't believe the story at all. She gets mad and throws a basketball really high in the air as she's leaving and it lands directly in the hoop. So now he believes her 100%. Well, but it's like the half court over the shoulder backwards shot here. Still. That happens. I've seen video of that happen. <laughs> yeah, but you didn't see the hundred videos where it didn't happen. <laughs> Neither did this kid watch a hundred people storm away angrily and miss this shot. That's it, that's his whole shtick is that he 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 makes people mad and throws a basketball at them to have them angrily throw it behind them <laughs> as yeah, they leave. That's it. In class the next day, the teacher walks around quizzing kids on random math facts. <laughs> Just like, uh, here's a random question. Here's a random question. <laughs> Instead of, like, a bunch of questions in the same lesson. Tracy gets the first one wrong of the class, and she's asked to stay after. 
The teacher seems to hate children and gets a real kick out of torturing Tracy here. That night, Tracy is watching one of those old Fruit of the Loom commercials with guys dressed as fruit. (laughs) And she's wearing a famous Amos cookie shirt, which I'm assuming that her dad actually had some hand in like distributing these or something because i don't know why else she would have this she's flipping through more commercials till she gets to johnny carson and ed mcmahon welcomes carson on stage but instead we see god come through the curtains tracy's surprised to see him in carson's place but he he guest hosted a lot so it doesn't surprise me yeah (laughs) uh but no it's it's actually supposed to be god here and he basically teleports into the room with her this is like one of a bunch of gimmicks that he does that are needless like yeah. the message in the fortune cookie and appearing on the tv before he appears yeah to her it's just like why why are why all these theatrics they, just, they have to make it remotely interesting <laughs> prove to her that he's godlike mm. she reads off a series of slogans that she clearly just ripped off of existing television commercials which is what she's stayed up all night watching how do you spell relief god which is obviously borrowed from an old Rolaids commercial, and You're in Good Hands with God, which has apparently been Allstate's slogan since the 50s. Wow. She starts another pitch, Let God Put You, and then God finishes the Hertz slogan with her in the driver's seat. The only one I couldn't connect to an existing company slogan was God is Bullish on Humanity, which is arguably the worst of her pitches. Uh, God isn't impressed because she stole most of these, uh, if not all of them, directly from television. And he gives her another week to get a better slogan. God says that dad can't help but approves Shingo assisting her. Mom comes home and asks who she's talking to and she pretends it was just a commercial. They're always trying to sell you things. The next day, she's spitballing with Shingo, but she shoots down all of her own ideas because she has a gut feeling that they're no good until Shingo gets impatient. Well, I got a gut feeling too. I'm hungry. Let's go home. We'll thank God tomorrow. What did you say? She decides Thank God is a brilliant slogan, and for a moment it seems like she's ripping off an existing slogan again until you realize that Apple's Think Different slogan wasn't trademarked until 1997. But upon further research, the Think Different campaign is widely accepted as a response to IBM's slogan, which was actually in use as far back as 1911 and was just the word think. Think, yeah. Later, Tracy pitches Think God to God in a diner. Outside, a couple of nosy bitches start making fun of the kid talking to herself inside, who, as far as they know, is just practicing a speech or something. Um. Also, until they actually wrote it out, I thought they were saying, thank God. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I was like, oh, thank God. Now I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got it before. Now I don't. Even though earlier God said that she would come up with a slogan and he would spread it around, he tells her now that it's her job to spread it around. He allots her an advertising budget of zero dollars and suggests she utilize child labor because he's a monster. I wouldn't know where to start. Why don't you start with your friends? But a whole big advertising campaign? How would I do that? I'm sure you'll find a way. I don't think this is fair. Why don't you pick on somebody who isn't behind in her homework? Tracy tells her whole class that they need to put these signs up everywhere and they call her a loony. Shingo turns the kids completely around just by saying, that's a great idea let's do it somehow all these kids are very excited now the bully of the bunch stands up to shit all over the idea and then suddenly he's endorsing it full-heartedly i've heard some dumb ideas i've heard some crazy ideas but i've got to tell you this one takes the cake and it should take the cake because it's a great <laughs> idea it's the greatest idea i've ever heard and then when he goes to sit back down he doesn't seem to know why he even said it this moment hints at a bigger plot hole of the film which is if god can force someone to believe in him automatically why does he need tracy or anybody (laughs) well i mean speaking outside the film there is the concept that god gave people free will and so we but he didn't give this kid free will (laughs) yeah that is that is a problem with this scene so like the whole concept of we're going to use advertising to convince people well he's not we're not convincing this kid we're just you know you know changing yeah, what he we're says just, we're putting a hand up his ass and puppeteering him <laughs> for this well, one scene right but then he doesn't once he realizes why did i say that he doesn't recant go wait 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 wait, wait. i didn't mean to say that yeah and he just goes along with it but also i feel like this is this is just a cheesy way to get all the kids on board because yeah. there's really no incentive yeah i don't i mean i don't necessarily think there has to be incentive because kids like will 
follow and do things that they see other kids doing. But then it should be like this gradual like, oh, she's writing this all over. I want to be cool like Tracy and write Thank God all over. You know, like there there should be this evolution of them picking up the idea instead of an auditorium of kids just suddenly going, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. (laughs) Um, And he also doesn't he doesn't utilize the power to just completely change someone's mind and make them say something they don't mean later in the film when it would have been really handy to do yeah if he actually cares about being believed in why does he give any of these kids a choice just make everyone believe in you because you're all powerful right and it's like well no i can't i can't just do whatever i want it's like oh i thought you're i thought you could do whatever you wanted but like i said i don't think it's a matter of not being able to do it i think it's the i gave humans free will and so but i think that that's a, a super valid point that they should bring up because this whole movie is about advertising, which is trying to form people's wills to yeah. your desired outcome. And what did Joan of Arc do wrong that he was like, meh, <laughs> I don't feel like changing this crowd's mind. Let her burn. That's fine. The kids all hang signs and graffiti the words, thank God, all over town. When Tracy gets home, her mom sits her down and asks, who is this invisible person that my friends keep seeing you talk to all over town? She admits that it's God, and her mom is very worried about it. Tracy tries to work on her homework when Shingo calls, and he's turned his bedroom into a sweatshop for Think God signs when Tracy tells him, <laughs> you you can just take over this job. I can't do this anymore. I have like two weeks worth of homework to catch up on, and she can't devote any more time to God. This whole thing seems like a step like around the coexist stickers. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, after she hangs up god appears again in her room and she says yeah i don't have time to do this anymore he says well you're in good company there's some heavy hitters in that club socrates martin luther king abe lincoln mahatma gandhi implying i suppose that she should be excited about her impending public assassination (laughs) she tells him that her parents think she's bananas bananas i hate that i make a beautiful fruit and people use it for crazy she's also way behind on her homework because she spent an entire week plagiarizing commercials to come up with a crappy two-word slogan god does her math homework while admitting to a few of his own personal mistakes the dead sea flamingos with their backwards kneecaps skunk defenses tracy points out that giraffe necks are another mistake and when god justifies it by pointing out that they can reach the leaves of the tall trees tracy asks why don't you just make the trees shorter where were you when i needed you downstairs tracy's parents freak out about her divine interventions Dad asks if it's possible that this is all a ploy for attention, and Mom laughs it off as preposterous, like it's not an extremely common thing yeah. for children of divorce to resort to, which it totally is. <laughs> Tracy comes downstairs, and Dad sits her down to discuss this God business. She shows Dad the math homework that God just finished as proof, and he says, this is clearly your handwriting, but I appreciate that he's trying to keep an open mind, because when she points out it would be very easy for God to replicate, he says... Yeah, I suppose it would be. <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> Why would he do this in his own handwriting? Her alibi is bulletproof. All right, go See, on upstairs. See, he's all powerful. He could write like a 10-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> she heads back upstairs. I, I, oh, I'm almost 40, and I still write like a 10-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> she heads back upstairs, and her parents decide that they will try to sort this out for themselves before going to any professionals. The next day, the principal finds the school plastered with Think God signs. His secretary, Edie McClurg, yeah. tells him that Tracy Richards is responsible. They think she's a righteous dude. (laughs) She doesn't say that part. She tells him that Tracy Richards is responsible, and then her parents are called in. She agrees to tell the kids to stop making signs, but stipulates that she will need God's permission to do this. So this is the scene where I thought things were going to take a turn. Right. Because they have the school counselor there, and and she's like, wait, God talks to you? He's like, yeah. Wait, what's he look like? He's like, oh, he looks like an old man. And I was like, Oh God! They're gonna think that there's some kind of predator. Oh, yes. Like it's weird so, that that doesn't occur to anyone. This right. Whole yes, I was waiting for that too. I was like, why does nobody? It's, uh, the father too. Like when she starts to admit this, like, oh, you saw him at the Chinese restaurant, or you, you know, like, it's like oh yeah, well, who is I remember this man I was on the phone you? and you did leave for a while while I was on the phone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So somebody is stalking this poor girl. Yeah. He came into the car while you were inside your office, yeah, Daddy. Claiming, like, he was like, what? Claiming <laughs> to be God and convincing you to do things for him yeah unless she has made up stories like this in the past they should be much more worried that this is a real person that she's talking about but the principal here basically says your daughter is suspended until you fix her brain and word spreads very quickly across campus so that the kids decide they're going to 
they're they're planning some kind of a revenge like a strike against the school because they're not letting their crazy friend go to school anymore but i I mean this whole this whole storyline is just kind of ridiculous because i think that we would have stopped these kids from writing thank god over everything a lot sooner this is a public school yeah there is they are not allowed to do that sort of thing i also think that kids this young would not organize a strike like if the teachers were like what no go back to class and they'd be like okay (laughs) <laughs> yeah <laughs> because they're they're not in the grade that would actually strike for this but or their parents wouldn't be like yeah i sent you to school like why are you making signs and marching outside of it go to your classroom learn yeah because then they act like oh it's all tracy's fault that these kids aren't going to class and it's like no it's literally everyone she else's didn't ask fault them to do this yeah. they're doing this on their own she's essentially starting a religious cult yeah <laughs> and the kid before was like what next you're gonna get us to shave our heads like what is going on here they take Tracy to a psychologist and God pops up when she's waiting in the in the waiting room outside of his office. In addition to being very late to speak with her, he also tells her a dumb, pointless story about a cat that helped a tiger in the jungle. Right. This is supposed to cheer her up while yeah. she's waiting to go into therapy. So a cat was in the jungle and a tiger had a spike in its foot and the cat helped it. And then the tiger's like, is there anything I can do for you? And the cat was like... Yeah, I'm scared of shit out here in the fucking jungle. What am I supposed to do? This is exactly how George Burns tells it. (laughs) And the tiger says, oh, just look tough. And then three years later, the tiger and the cat saw each other again. And the tiger said, you're a cat. I know you're a cat. The end. And the little girl is just as dumbfounded at this shitty story as we are. And then he says, oh, it was meant to cheer you up. So she smiles more out of obligation than because the story wasn't dumb. The psychiatrist, without having met Tracy at all, tells her parents exactly what's wrong. She's traumatized by the divorce and invented an imaginary father figure. Which I think is a good analysis of what is happening. But also, he wouldn't have told them any of his suspicions without having talked to this girl for five seconds yet. Back at the school, the kids have staged this walkout until their delusional classmate is allowed back in the classroom. Tracy is evaluated by several doctors. They all do different scans and tests and... She's put through like a Linda Blair yeah, yes, exactly. level of, yeah. of tests. Like there's clearly something wrong with this girl. She's believing in God. It's it's literally <laughs> the exact opposite of the exercise scene. <laughs> where it's just like, oh man, you took a crucifix out and you prayed with it. How dare you? For a Rorschach test at the end, she says everything looks like food. And the scientist is like, oh, very interesting. And she's like, I think I'm just hungry. The psychiatrist recommends committing her to an institution. Her parents are obviously upset, but agree to this plan. Tracy sits on a bench in the park. It's the same park from the last married couple, uh, which is obviously from the same director. It's right outside of our friend's apartment. Um, And she's here, I think, waiting for God or expecting him to show up to talk to her. But he doesn't show up. And it's been a few days since they talked. So she wanders around town. She's like wandering into churches and stuff. Her where, parents are sending her to are an her institution parents? tomorrow. Right, literally, your kid, you're concerned about the mental state of your child. And how is this child going around town by herself to churches and synagogues and parks? Unattended. There's yeah. no parent with her. What is happening? She just said she was going to go outside and play. And they're all like, okay, crazy girl who's going go to an institution we'll tomorrow. We'll see you in six hours. Just go outside and play. Um, but she's looking around this church and she's begging for God. She's like on the verge of tears asking for him to come to her and talk to her and he's nowhere to be found. And she says it's been three days and she hasn't had any signs. That night she puts on the Tonight Show, but no God. Uh, She shoots a suction cup dart at Shingo's bedroom window and she tells him that she's running away to avoid the institution. He sets her up with a room at his grandparents' house and the next morning dad shows up to the house And her parents read the goodbye letter that she wrote that I'm not going to a funny farm and uh, I'm sorry you didn't believe me or whatever. Shingo's grandparents didn't really understand what Shingo was asking them, but they know that they're being asked to take care of this kid because Shingo's Japanese isn't great. So they're just like, I don't know, I guess we're taking care of this kid now. I don't know why she's here, but apparently they're they're hosting her willingly. Well, but they seem to be like aware that they could be arrested (laughs) when whoever comes to claim her. Tracy's dad asks Shingo where she is, and eventually he breaks. But he calls her before her folks get there, and he's like, hey, heads up, your parents are inbound. I had to tell them. So she sneaks out to an Amtrak station to just leave town or something. I don't know what she... She doesn't have money, so she can't get on a train. Nope. So she's just going to live at this Amtrak station. 
and like a homeless guy checks her out and it's freaking her out um but then god appears again and he chastises her for running away because his plan was for her to take damaging medication and then get a lobotomy somewhere he offers to take her home and on the way out she asks him the standard god question and he gives the standard god answer why do good things happen to bad people and then he asks her you ever see a front without a back top without a bottom and up without a down okay then there can't be good without bad he admits as a lead into this answer that it's a cop-out and obviously nobody would have trouble imagining a world where kids don't die of cancer that doesn't answer the question yeah but also yeah bad things happen to good people and stuff like that but a lot of bad things happen to the people you put on tasks so what why yeah. did you do this to me also, good stuff <laughs> happens to question. bad people <laughs> yeah can you just sort it out so that the bad stuff happens to the bad people or maybe it does and we just don't know what they did maybe lincoln deserved that who knows i think this guy's more like a mall santa version of god than the actual deity he's not all-knowing or all-powerful by his own admission so far the only powers he's proven are teleportation telepathy and conditional invisibility god drives them home in his motorcycle with a sidecar and a pair of motorcycle cops see them on the road for a bit and give chase but when they notice that there's a child in the sidecar and nobody driving they pull over and just give up <laughs> let's just not follow up on this it's I too mean, weird they they notice that immediately which is why they're chasing them i think they give up when he speeds up and just gets around a couple cars and gets ahead of them i thought they were chasing him initially because he was speeding and then he went even faster than they could go yeah i, I mean know. i think he did go faster than they could go which is why they gave up yeah but i think they knew immediately that there was nobody in the driver's yeah. seat tracy's parents get home from searching and they find her in her bedroom she tells them that god brought her home and they're like oh well that's good i guess at least oh good the pedophile motorcycle. brought you home <laughs> what <laughs> and she tells them that she's ready to be committed now we cut to a news report from the real news anchor hugh downs who just passed away recently uh, about the worldwide consequences of tracy's campaign kids all over the world are hanging think god signs in different languages somebody scribbled it in arabic across the front of the yeah space. we're vandalizing important monuments now we cut to dr joyce brothers for some reason and she explains that religious kids are more stable than other kids and that she's probably telling the truth because kids are more in touch with reality than adults except for joyce brothers apparently <laughs> <laughs> downs continues his report with footage of the kids on strike at school and he explains that the superintendent is standing by his decision to suspend her but a judge will be deciding the case today based on the advice of a panel of experts the doctors decide near unanimously that this girl should be institutionalized <laughs> as suspected one doctor seems reluctant though and is repeatedly shouted down by dr whitley the man leading this conference she's right then uh, we're all wrong they bring Tracy and her folks in to inform them of the decision that's been made when God interrupts the proceedings. He introduces himself as Dr. Stevens, which is the first time canonically, including the Bible, that we learn God's last name. <laughs> God, God brings up a comment that Dr. Whitley just made. If she's right, then they're wrong. And then he directs their attention to a chandelier over the table before vanishing it. When even this doesn't sway them completely, he replaces the daytime outside with night and then back today. The music gets comically dramatic here, and on his way out of the room, God just vanishes into thin air, and the door opens and closes magically on its own. Which I, which I think is a reference to the first movie. Right. Well, the leading. whole movie is a reference to the first movie. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but I feel like at this point, as the doctor, I'd be like, yeah, I am questioning what I just saw, like, is there a gas leak in here? What is mm -hmm. happening? But either way, this girl is also having hallucinations about God. We should all be medically treated, not just her. Yeah. <laughs> um, the first movie is John Denver's like a supermarket manager. And God ap appears to him and tells him things. You know, I want people to be nice to each other. I want the world to be peaceful. Stop all the wars. Stop all the downloading. You know, that kind of stuff. And uh, he loses his job. He almost loses his wife. He's getting in trouble with all these people because nobody believes him. They think he's going crazy. And he goes to court for some reason to prove that God exists. Mm -hmm. I forget who even brings him to court. And I watched this movie like two days ago. But he's in court and he's trying to prove that God did talk to him. And that's why uh, he says all these things. And then same as this movie, God shows up in the courtroom at the last second and says, 
oh yeah magic 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 and then he turns around and leaves and turns invisible and pushes open that gate in the courtroom on his way out and it's just the same thing beat for beat here Mm -hmm. but it's a kid who's losing everything instead of an adult it feels like the kid movie should have been the first movie yeah and the adult one should have been the second one yeah because this this room with a bunch of doctors in it is not anywhere near as interesting as a courtroom so it feels like a huge step down in terms of being interesting at all that's that's how uh this moment ends and tracy's parents excuse themselves from the room and insist they need to get their daughter ready for school tomorrow technically though it hasn't been decided yet and i'm fairly certain that the judge will convene a second panel of experts when the first one reports back oh yeah we looked into it and yeah she totally talked to god erased the chandelier and everything so (laughs) it's it's all real turns out i want to know where the hordes of religious zealots are that are defending her because shouldn't there be a whole bunch of people that are like oh my god a prophet from god we should worship her and and defend her from going to a mental institute i think the reason she doesn't have that is because she has zero proof she doesn't even have like a specific message from god she just says he gave her a ride like i came up with the message from he popped up and said hello (laughs) and uh and yeah, exactly. She came up with the message, so it's not even from him. It's not God's words; it's my words. <laughs> yeah, but that's part of why I don't think he's all knowing. Is in 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 the first movie too. He says, uh, John Denver asks him like, "Well, don't you know what's going to happen?" He's like, "Well, I will know what's going to happen once it's happened." Me because, too. And it's like, yeah, that's the same as everybody else. That you don't have any special knowledge of the future. No, not until it's the past. And it's like, okay, great. So you're just a person then. With, with the ability to transport yourself he's magically. like houdini <laughs> yeah but and and then in this movie like he's like oh i'm sorry i couldn't you know i'm a very busy guy i got a lot of stuff to do and it's like for some reason i thought you were all powerful you could do like everything at the same time you re- you can make this whole planet in a week and you can't show up to me to say hi in a week and let me know i'm not going crazy and what is he doing is he doing this to children all over the world yeah i mean it's cruel so is the thing god that's happening in egypt not even her work yeah it's another kid that he told to go do that maybe he put the words thank god into into the kid's mouth in this movie what's his name shingo he told shingo to say that at the park this kid is definitely not going to school tomorrow. They're all going to a hospital to be treated for the gas leak they were likely exposed <laughs> to said. here at the building. <laughs> back in the Chinese restaurant, Tracy's parents are back together because it's the 80s. And that's how movies end. The happy ending is the divorced parents get back together. Even though they clearly, from the course of this movie, we do not belong not be together. together. <laughs> I, I think there would have been a good, a good moment to have a funny bit of uh, when God had changed the day to night and then back to day that they actually lost a day <laughs> yeah it, it was the next day she's like already late for school <laughs> but the fortune cookies on the table are bouncing around like mexican jumping beans and instead of opening any tracy just pops back over to the lounge assuming that that's where god wants her to go he thanks her for the slogan and the successful campaign he refuses to take credit for her parents getting back together because he knows how it's going to go no he doesn't he doesn't know anything until it happens He says that he's heading out and that he'll be back in touch the next time he has a problem that needs solving. And then he walks away and disappears like he's Grandpa JJ at the end of Little Dragons. (laughs) We end the film on a freeze frame of a crying child abandoned by God. That's the end of the movie. Our director here is Gilbert Cates. He did Last Married Couple in America earlier this year, which is never a good sign when you have two titles that come out in the same year. It means one of them went real quick, and it was this one. Mostly TV movies after this, but he did produce the Academy Awards for most years between 1990 and 2008. The story and script were written by Josh Greenfeld. He previously wrote Harry and Tonto with Paul Mazursky, for which he received an Oscar nomination. His only other credit was for something called Lovey, A Circle of Children Part 2, which I don't want to see. Another writer, Hal Goldman, basically just Jack Benny and George Burns TV stuff. Another writer, Fred S. Fox, lots of Golden Age television, and then from the 80s on, it's all Bob Hope stuff. Writer, Seaman Jacobs, same as Fred, just Bob Hope stuff. And writer, Melissa Miller, this was her only credit. Novel was from Avery Corman. In addition to his three Oh God credits from one book, he also wrote the novel Kramer vs. Kramer, which was adapted into huh. the Best Picture winning film. Huh. The music here was from Charles Fox 
who is the same composer as the last Gilbert Cates film, Last Married Couple. He also composed Little Darlings and Why Would I Lie so far this year, and we'll have him back for 9 to 5 later this year. George Burns was God. He plays God in all the O-Gods. Uh, he's also Joe in Going in Style, which was recently remade by Zach Braff, starring Michael Caine in the George Burns role. It also stars Alan Arkin, who was the first choice to play John Denver's part in the first Oh God, which makes sense because it was, it was directed by, um, what's his name that just passed away? Mel Brooks's buddy. Reiner. Reiner. Carl Reiner. So George Burns plays Grandpa Munster in The Sunshine Boys. That's not true. He plays another character with the same name, unless I typed it in wrong. His last role was Milt Lackey in the Radioland Murders, which is a Woody Allen film. He played a, another godlike character in Sgt. Pepper. Oh, did he? Uh, is that he what play, inspired he the casting pl- here? He plays Mr. Kite. There will be a show tonight. Suzanne Plachette was Paula Richards. She plays Annie Hayworth in The Birds. She's Emily Hartle on The Bob Newhart Show. And she does the voice of Yubaba in Spirited Away. David Burney was Don Richards. That's the father. Not not many credits. Lou Anne was Tracy Richards. Her only other feature credit was as Susie Middleburg in A Night in the Life of Jimmy Reardon. John Louis was Shingo. He plays the Chinese boy in Gremlins that smuggles Gizmo out of the shop. He's also Paul Indian in Summer Camp Nightmare and June in They Call Me Bruce. Conrad Janis played Charles Benson, the school principal. He plays the father in the TV movie Double Trouble in the movie Cable Guy. He's the father of <laughs> okay. the fictionalization of, or no, maybe, is he the actual father of the Ben Stiller twins? Or is he the father in the TV movie of the Ben Stiller twins? <laughs> I think that's what it is. Um, he's also uh, Mindy Kaling's father. Mindy Kaling's father. <laughs> he's also Mindy's father on Mork and Mindy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not mindy kaling's father hugh downs played the nbc newscaster uh, as we're recording this he passed away earlier this month uh, he was a sidekick on jack parr's tonight show and then he was the co-host of nbc news from 62 to 71 and an anchor of the abc news magazine 2020 from 78 to 99 joyce brothers plays herself on nbc she's an american psychologist and television personality she appears as herself in the king of comedy and Van Wilder, and on Picky and the Brain. And she plays a coroner in Loaded Weapon 1. I was going to say, doesn't she, is, doesn't she also play herself in uh, the first Naked Gun movie? Yeah, she's in the... She's in there too? Yeah, so it's, it's when they're at the baseball game, and they're going through all the announcers, and like it's like, I'm joined by so-and-so, so-and-so, and Dr. Joyce Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> like it's a radio program, but it's the... Yeah. That's funny. Uh, Wilfred Hyde White played Judge Thomas Miller. He played crabbin in the third man he's colonel pickering in my fair lady uh we just had him as abbot thelonius in in god we trust and he was the voice of zeus in xanadu all these uh god god movies God three god movies this year marion mercer played harriet manley she'll be back as missy hart in nine to five later this year denise galick We've had her a few times this year. She played Joan, Don's big-boobed girlfriend. She was Linda Beale in Humanoids, and she was Lisa in Don't Answer the Phone. And she was also Lucy in Melvin and Howard, though I forget who Lucy was. Tad Harino played Mr. Yamamoto. He was Sam Woe in Galaxina. He's Confucius from Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, and he plays Grandfather in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3. Sunshine Parker was the railroad station derelict. He was the gas station attendant in Heartbeat. He plays Old Codger in Any Which Way You Can later this year. He plays a hobo in Pee-wee's Big Adventure, and he played Edgar Deems in Tremors. <laughs> he always wears that damn jacket. <laughs> Edie McClurg was Mr. Benson's secretary. Obviously, we had her earlier this year as Chicken Charlie's wife in Cheech and Chong's next movie. She's Grace in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Uh, she's Marge Sweetwater in Back to School chastity pariah and elvira she's the voice of mrs seaworthy on the snorks and she's the voice of <laughs> carlotta in the little mermaid howard who's, duff wait who's carlotta that's the woman who is doing oh, the laundry and yes, brushing yes, yes. the crab yes she is that makes sense <clears throat> howard duff uh was dr benjamin charles whitley that's the mean guy in the meeting at the end he played frank niles in naked city he's senator duvall in no way out and he's john shaughnessy who is Dustin Hoffman's lawyer from Kramer and Kramer uh, from another novel by Avery Corman. And the last credit I have here was uh, 
Hans Conried, who played Dr. Barnes, that's the doctor who was reluctant to say that she was crazy, that they kept shouting down at the last meeting. He's the voice of Snidely Whiplash on the Bullwinkle Show and Dudley Do-Right. Mm-hmm. He's also the voice of Thorn Oakenshield in the 77 Hobbit. And he's the voices of Mr. Darling and Captain Hook in Disney's Peter Pan. Oh. Uh, I also wanted to point out not so much the, the, the actress, but the credit of Psychologist 1, Psychologist 2, Psychologist 3, Woman Psychologist. Yes. <laughs> yes. I was like, what? <laughs> I was yeah, I didn't notice that credit, but I was actually really impressed that they had a bunch of women or at least two women on the board of experts and yeah. psychologists, but then really bothered by the fact that the woman is about to ask another question and the guy's like, "No, no, we don't need any more questions." It's like, "Let her speak." <laughs> She's asking a kid a, ch- a child a question to determine whether or not this kid is going to an institution. <laughs> like, "Let her ask the damn question." Well, it's funny though because because of that sexism, she's actually more recognizable from the credits than yeah. psychologists one two and three <laughs> because it's like oh well i know which one you're talking about then uh i also like that she's got the only one who does any kind of interesting character reaction after god leaves she's like frantically fumbling in her purse for a cigarette and trying to <laughs> light it <laughs> that's funny. And i was like that's, yeah, that's the only character in this whole room i didn't catch that yeah that's uh <sighs> That's this movie. Hi, how was the movie? Done. Oh. Yeah, this movie was frustrating end to end. There's did... n- there's not a lot to it. And uh, it's just the same conversation happening over and over again. Nothing is changing over it. And the Thank God story, because even with the news segment, it feels so cheap and low, low scale. Yeah. Like there's nothing to it. Yeah. There's no there's no crazy change in the world that has happened because of her. It's yeah. just people are memorizing a slogan or repeating a slogan. Like, have, has she actually enacted any good because of this? No. No. There's it's just, nothing. this whole thing bothered me. I didn't like this movie. And it's a down for me, for sure. It's something that you said while we were watching this was, this movie couldn't get made today. Right. Yeah, I think I told you that if they made it today that the dad would for sure be Kevin Sorbo. Like, <laughs> it, it would be one of those, like, super cheapo faith-based movies because everyone else would be like, I don't get it. Why does what she's doing matter? I don't understand. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't, it, like, it just doesn't make sense. In, and, I, and I realized in the last 40 years that our society has probably swung a little bit more atheist than, than we were in 1980, but... I mean, did nobody ask any questions when making this movie about why we're doing this? Yeah, I I don't I don't get it. Yeah, uh, it definitely felt like it was supposed to be more of a kids movie, but did it though? Well, no. I mean, in in that it's a story about this little girl. Yeah, and it definitely had, but it's the the themes are too mature. Right, but I and think the conversations it, would all go over a kid's head for the most part. Right, but I also feel like it's too much time with a kid and from a kid's yeah. perspective to be something an adult would enjoy watching. I didn't even enjoy watching the first one, and it's just beat for beat the same thing. A guy says, God told me this, and then people are like, you're weird, and then it culminates with God having to prove that he existed yeah. to just one room full of people. Right. And there's no proof that he was ever there at the end. Right, we didn't actually prove anything. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but, but I think that that works as a standalone movie as here is an interesting interpretation of God coming to a person and the results end of that, put that done. It's done. We finished it. There's only one book. You know, I, I feel that with these sequels, you, you're forced to ask more questions Yeah. yeah. and that's when things start coming apart. Yeah. I think the only reason, cause Carl Reiner being the director confuses the hell out of me. Why would Carl Reiner care about this story? And I think the answer is he didn't care about the story. Mm. He did it because it was a George Burns movie. And George Burns probably is the one who had the passion for this project. What year did the first one come out? Do you know? 77 or okay. something like that. Um, right. So it wasn't picked it w- up because we're like, oh, this is an Oscar winning uh, author. No. Okay. No, this was this. He wrote that book and that movie came out before Kramer versus Kramer. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why this movie got made. And and George Burns, I mean, for the icon that he was, it, it just seems like such a, a weird set of movies to kind of like peter out your career to. 
Yeah, because this recurring God character. I th- they definitely do a better job with God's dialogue in the first movie. Um, that it seems like clever and there's like a, a wit to it. But here he's just saying like what any given screenwriter on the planet would give God's dialogue. Mm-hmm. Oh well, why do why do good things happen to bad people? I can't tell you. That's just how it works. And it's like okay, so you don't you didn't have anything like interesting to put in God's mouth here. You're just gonna say what I would have guessed off the top of my head right. would be your answer. Yeah, I'm not sure who the target audience for this movie is. Yeah. It doesn't really make sense. I don't like the first movie wasn't a kids movie, and as we said, this is a rehash and uh, but with a kid character. I don't know. Who, I don't know who they expected to go watch. I guess it's a family film, but the, I don't think there's enough humor in it to be like a feel good family film. Mm-hmm. And it's also, a, it's just tragic. Honestly, what's happening in this movie is tragic. Yeah, and it's honestly, I it sounds weird to say it, but this movie, the main draw is is the visual effects. Other than George Burns, the main draw is the visual effects, and the visual effects are on par with what Millier was doing in, like, 1902. Yeah. Like, it's just the most simple, stupid camera tricks where you stop down, and then the person moves to the other side of the room, and you start recording again, and none of it looks interesting at all. It's, it just feels so cheap, and they only had, like, four locations, and they're just reusing them over and over again. Anyway, it's bad. It's a down. Yeah, it's a Down. Down. Um, where's this going? Letterbox, Jess. It's low. It's real low. It's at one thirteen for the year. Um, one thirteen out of one hundred and twenty-two. Out of one hundred and twenty-two, I don't ever need to see this movie again. It is just below Bon Voyage, Charlie Brown, wow. and just above Phobia. All right, Richard. Uh, I have this at one o two, um, putting it just below the Baltimore Bullet and just above Stunt Rock. All right. I also have it at one o two. For me, that is just under the exterminator and just above the kidnapping of the president, which had even fewer locations than this movie somehow. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's everything for this one. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, or as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show. And if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, you can also support the show through Patreon.com slash Vintage Video Podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing One Trick Pony, which IMDb describes like so. Jonah, Paul Simon, is an aging rock star trying to put together a new album in the face of an indifferent record label and a talentless producer. We leave you now with a trailer for One Trick Pony. You have wanted to be Elvis Presley since you're 13 years old. I care about our marriage breaking up. Left Maddie and me. Paul Simon and Blair Brown. One Trick Pony, a film from Warner Brothers.